Oh, and now we're live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, if everybody out there can hear me for all the attendees that are in there, if you look at your individual picture and you see that your name is magically Kate instead of whatever your name may be, you can right click on your login, your image, um, and then tell it rename and you can change your name accordingly. That way, if you have questions, we, we will be able to identify you easier than just Kate has a lot of questions. <laughs> We do not need about 50 Kates in this world, I can guarantee. <laughs> and there is a Kate that has a hand up. How do I see my picture? <laughs> well, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, I wonder, cause they don't have video. Yeah, that very well could be true. Um, okay. So in the case of you can't actually see your image and your video like we can, then you can, uh, if you send a chat message or you click in there, it pops up with your name and you can do the same thing on that specific thing. So like Kate, uh, the, the, the Kate that raised your hand, if you right click on that, you can go into, or sorry, more. Um, if you hover over it, it might give you the option to click more and click rename. That's, uh, that's about the only other option on there for that. I think one of the links that went out may have been duplicated so that everybody got the test link with Kate. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Technical difficulties every time. Okay. Well, it's seven. So even if everyone is named Kate tonight, uh, we can still learn about bees. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll... Um, We'll go ahead and get started. I would just ask if you submit a question or a comment um, to maybe add your name so we know who you are instead of calling everybody Kate. Uh, but welcome tonight. This is the Williamson County Master Gardener monthly meeting. We're glad you're here. Um, I've been really excited about this topic. Um, just John came and spoke last year about bees and I think uh, plants that attract bees, if I remember right. Um, you had some pollinators. And we did. Uh, we talked about um, planting for pollinators and we talked about kind of the importance of bees and we also had one section of it, which we're going to do a little bit of a recap of, but like the, the biology of a bee, because um, that all kind of plays back into their intelligence level. So we'll, we'll go over some of that stuff again for sure. Great. The language of bees. That's the other one. The language of okay. bees. Awesome. Well, I'm excited about this. So um, just a few things. We'll, we'll try to save some questions at the end, but if you have a burning question pertinent, um, put it in the Q&A box and I'll try to moderate those so that um, we can ask John our questions. Um, and then if we have a few minutes at the end, we'll wrap up by answering those questions. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll just, I'll kick it off to you, John. All right, I am uh, almost ready to get going. I am hypothetically renaming people and potentially the wrong name. <laughs> okay, so we, we will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna switch this back to speaker view. Um, hopefully everybody can see me and through the presentation, what we're gonna do is this will, this will kind of bounce back and forth on uh, a slide presentation and then also back to myself to go through and kind of guide everybody along. So starting off, first and foremost, um, I am going to, I'm going to leave the uh, moderating to you, Kate. I'm going to close this little window on my screen. Okay. Got it. There we go. Okay. So um, let's see, sharing the screen. We'll get started here on presentations. So First and foremost, this is a presentation on the intelligence of bees. 
And in this presentation, we're going to look at the intricate and astounding ways that honeybees can communicate, navigate, and oh, communicate and navigate in their tiny little worlds. From a super sense of smell to the precision dance moves and even the ability to make rational decisions, these tiny little insects will amaze you with their intelligence. Now, that is the appropriate introduction um, for the actual presentation. However, the presentation itself could also just as easily be called, <laughs> there we go, a look at how far bee, at, <laughs> look at how bees are far smarter than we are and how they are just waiting for their opportunity to overthrow us and become the new masters of the universe. Seriously though, this is, it, it really, it astounds me every time I go through and talk about bees and every time I learn something new because I go to workshops and presentations and stuff and I'm constantly learning even as a master beekeeper and the more things that I learn the more astounded I am by this tiny little insect this one little critter has so many potential avenues for growth and for its intelligence and how it expresses them and we don't necessarily look at those things whenever we go through and we just see a bug or an insect. We just think, oh, it's a bee. You know, it goes and it pollinates flowers. But in reality, there's so much more going on underneath the surface of this. So that's kind of what we're going to go through and tackle today. And that is uh, where we shall start. And hopefully this all flows accordingly. So moving along. That was not moving along. Let's try that again. There we go. So the anatomy of a bee. Um, we're going to go through just real quick to make sure that everybody is on the same page. We're going to do a recap on the anatomy of the bee, and then we're going to talk about some of the language of the bees because this all folds back into their intelligence level. So first and foremost, we are talking about an insect, and that insect is Apis mellifera. Um, although for us here in Texas, it is sometimes Apis mellifera scutellata, which is um, the formerly known as Africanized genetics or Africanized bee. So we, we have both. They're both a honeybee. They're still Apis mellifera as the, the main class. And in these little critters, we have a lot of similarities with any other insect. So if I go through here and um, I'm gonna turn on the laser pointer and we'll see if this little thing works here for us. So we have the compound eye, which the compound eye is basically the bee's navigation system. They can see through that. It does have multifaceted lenses in there and that allows the bee to see better the faster it moves or the faster you move. So that means if you're running and screaming and flailing, this allows the bee to hone in on you and it basically paints you as a giant neon target. So that's what the compound eye is used for. That's the primary use of it. And again, the quicker the bee moves, the better it can see. But up here on the top of its head, it has three other little oculi, three other little eyes. And those eyes are photoreceptors. They literally just detect light and dark, and that's it. Their sole purpose is to help the bee navigate by knowing where the position of the sun is in the sky in relation to the hive. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's a cloudy day or not. That's how the bees actually navigate. Now, this can also make the bees confused if you have a hive that is nearby, say, a street light or a porch light, and that light comes on at dusk these photoreceptors will actually cause the bee to be much like a moth and it will lead them to that light and can kind of disorient them. Now the other part of the bee that is extremely crucial and important for this conversation is the antenna. The antenna is, it is literally all sensory organs that the bee needs when it comes to smell and any of those olfactory type receptors. Now one of the amazing little notes that I like to keep in mind here is when we talk about dogs, we say that a dog is, you know, a hundred times better at a sense of smell than a human. Well, a bee can easily be a hundred times better and more accurate at a sense of smell than a dog. They can take things and break them down to a molecular level, which allows them to identify all kinds of different things that we ourselves completely miss out on. It, it brightens their entire world and it adds so much information and data to what they're able to do. Now, outside of that, the rest of this is, is very straightforward for an insect. It's got mandibles. It has its tongue, which is called a proboscis. On the tip of the tongue is a fuzzy little sponge that it uses to filter out any debris. It has dorsal claws. It has its six primary legs. And on the back leg, 
it has a spindle hair, which is what it uses to pack that pollen into a little ball and carry it back there. That's what we call the pollen basket. It has these little spiracles down the back of its abdomen or along the side of its abdomen. That is its respiratory system where it breathes from. And then it's got actually four wings. It's got two front wings and two hind wings. And in nature, there, there's the old adage, it was actually meant for a bumblebee, but there's the adage that technically a bee based on the laws of aerodynamics should not be able to fly. And when you take each individual wing and you look at it, and then you look at the body weight and mass of the bee, that is correct. However, these two wings can attach and detach right along that line by a bunch of little hooks and rings. And these hooks and rings allow the bee to go and hook those two wings together to make one big wing, which then does actually allow it to get more aerodynamic and be able to take off and fly. So those are the primary things that we wanna look at there when we talk about the anatomy of a bee. Now, outside of the anatomy of a bee, we have, again, we talked about the antennas, so we're gonna go into their forms of communication. And their primary form of communication is that olfactory sense. It is all about smells and it is all about these things called pheromones. In the bee's world, the pheromones literally rule everything. They are the way that the bee can communicate with each other. It's how it knows everything inside the colony is okay or there's danger or there's an enemy. These all come back to pheromones and it all comes back to that bee both being able to generate those pheromones as well as interpret exactly what they mean. So the main bee that has the highest level of pheromone is the queen herself. And the queen bee regulates all the other bees inside the colony by emitting what is called a queen mandibular pheromone. This pheromone does multi things inside there, but one of the key features of it is it actually inhibits the growth of the ovaries for all of the other bees. So all the other workers are female bees. All these bees you see in the picture with the exception of this little boy hiding down here, they're all females and they all technically have the ability to lay an egg, except the queen's pheromone prevents their ovaries from ever developing and ever being able to allow them to do that. So the queen holds a lot of power inside this colony. Her pheromones also tell the rest of the colony that she's healthy, that she's fully mated, that there's no issues or disease going on with her specifically. And the colony can then take that and they spread that information by trophallaxis is one thing where they go through and they actually feed each other. But they also spread it by grooming the queen and then getting those pheromones on themselves and taking those throughout the colony. Now, in addition to the queen's pheromones, there are pheromones in the wax itself. It has its own pheromone signature. And there's pheromones down inside each of these little cavities inside the cells where the brood are located. So this is what the brood looks like. And the brood, these tiny little grub worm looking critters down here in the bottom of the cells, all of them also are able to emit their own pheromones. And these pheromones from the brood, they also let the bees know that everything is healthy, everybody's okay, and that the queen is still laying because there's still brood present. Now the brood can also go through and they can emit a pheromone that also is basically a an alarm pheromone from their own perspective. So if a mite gets inside there and starts feeding on that larva, the larva can actually emit a pheromone that the worker bees will determine is negative. They will then go and they will uncap that cell and they will remove the larva and the parasite that's in there feeding on it in an effort to kind of sacrifice the one for the betterment of the entire colony. So that is another way that the pheromones can kind of come into play there. Now these pheromones, they are the sting pheromone, the alarm pheromone, the guards that are at the front entrance of the colony, they will all line up right along the peripheral edge of the comb or right at the entrance of the colony. And when an intruder shows up, they will actually raise their abdomen and emit a pheromone that spreads throughout the colony and lets the rest of the bees know there is an intruder, everybody needs to be on the defensive. Some of the other pheromones like the sting pheromone, when you actually get stung, it tags you with a pheromone marker that then tells all the other guard bees in the area to go straight to that same spot and sting you in that same region to maximize the effect of the sting. So again, pheromones are a huge deal for the bees. If we look outside of the pheromones and we go over here and we take a look at the other part of the bees communication, which I lost my mouse, give me just a second here. <laughs> 
there we go. Um, so if we go over and we take it the other part of the communication, that is actually going to be the dances. And we have all heard about the bee dances, right? The most notable one is what? I can't actually hear any of you, but you can feel free to shout it out. Everybody should know it. It is the waggle dance. And I'm doing it right now, but you can't really see me shaking because you know the booty's down below the video. So, but that's the waggle dance. They go through and they actually do this dance that can identify so many different things than what we would necessarily give it credit for. So if we look at a diagram of the dance itself, this is kind of what's going on in there. So you've got what they call a straight run, and that is this line right here that goes straight up the center. Now it's got a curve in there because that is where the bee actually does the waggle. That's where the abdomen is swinging side to side and the bee is buzzing. So the way that it works is literally precision geometry. They find the point of the hive, the point of the sun, and the point of the food source or other source that they're trying to tell the rest of the colony about. And then they do this dance. And this line is always in a direct representation of the angle of the source from the colony versus the sun. So you can see how this here lines up with this line here. Now to make it even more precise, every two minutes, that angle will change. As the sun traverses the sky, that angle goes through and moves and changes. So what the B does is the distance right here in the straight run is an actual algorithm and equation that equates to how far away this food source is from the colony. So they may be telling the bees, you need to leave the colony and you need to fly exactly a quarter of a mile due east from the colony based on the rotation of the sun and you will find this food source. Now, as they come back around, they will do it again. And when they're doing the waggle, the ferocity or the vigor that they shake their booty with and the more times they do that, that is the higher the quality of whatever it is they're trying to talk about. So the more furious that vibration is, the more they're saying, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the best thing. You guys have got to go out there and get it. But if it's just kind of a, eh, you know, they don't put a lot of effort into it, then they're actually saying that the food source is there, but it might be subpar. It's not really great. Now, one of the other things that actually happens is when that food source, so the, the waggle dance itself is precision over a hundred foot away. So a hundred foot and further out, this waggle dance does great. But if the food source ends up being a little bit closer, that whole figure eight shake and dance kind of turns into a circle that looks a little bit like this. And that is what we call the round dance. Now, the round dance is basically the bees version of going through and saying, oh my God, oh my God, there's food and it's right here. It's right here at our colony. So they don't have the precision to know where to go at that point what they're gonna do is they're going to spread out of their colony and they're gonna go in a big circle and they're gonna look for anything that could potentially be a food site. For a beekeeper like myself, this type of information is very good to know because if I put out food and I accidentally spill some outside of a colony somewhere, another bee can detect that, go into its colony and tell them there's food right here. But they didn't say there's a drop right over there, they said right here. So all the bees fan out and they will start looking in everything, including other colonies that you may have, which then incites robbing and fighting and all this other stuff. So knowing the distance, knowing how these dances work, you can use this to your advantage as a beekeeper. You can also use it to your advantage if you are a bee hunter. And those individuals actually use these dances and new, use the mathematical equation based on distance to be able to reverse engineer where a bee came from and follow that bee all the way back to its original colony. So that is one of the really cool things that can actually happen with that whenever you're looking at the differences in the dances themselves. So those are the two primary forms of communication. You've got the olfactory sense from the pheromones and the antenna picking up all these different little molecular levels of things. And then you have the actual vibration from the dancing. So, let me switch back over here to the PowerPoint and uh, show you guys some of the different things that can actually be seen by the bees when they go through and they do this dance. So first and foremost, the dances can show an unlimited amount of possibilities. One of those possibilities is the location of a water source. 
they can actually go through and they need the water. They need it to both hydrate themselves. They use it to cool off their colony in the summertime, like right now in August when it's super hot. They will bring droplets of water and disperse them around the colony on the comb and on the side walls of the hive and then strategically place bees to fan their wings to create their own version of a swamp cooler that will go through and cool that hive down. So that's one of the reasons for water. One of the other things that they use this dance communication for is nectar and pollen. And you know this is pretty obvious to all of us. We know that the honeybees go out there, they're looking for nectar, they find the nectar, they get the pollen, they pollinate all of our beautiful plants and flowers for us. And then they bring that back to the colony for their food stores and their food sources. This is all with the same dance. Now I want you to keep that in mind because that's gonna come back into play as we start talking about this intelligence level. They're doing one dance and they're telling you, hey, there's water here, there's nectar here, there's pollen here, and they can use that same dance to identify a new home location. So again, there is actually some level of intelligence and some level of communication that is going on inside this colony that is far beyond our limited understanding. And we have come leaps and bounds in how we understand the way that a colony works and the way that a bee works. So if we go through and we take a look at a colony, this is a cluster of bees right here. This would still be con considered a colony, but this is actually a swarm. And I want you to look real closely at this giant cluster of bees that is hanging from this tree right here. That cluster of bees, every one of these little bees is its own individual unique organism. But when we look at honeybees as a whole, we don't look at the individual bee because the individual bee is the same concept as a cell inside of our own bodies. We have to look at the entire colony because it is a super organism. It functions as one entity. And some of the bees are its defensive mechanisms. Some of them are its stomach. The queen is both its reproductive generative force and the heart of the entire colony. There's all these different things that go in there. But this giant mass of bees has a similarity to one other thing. And that other thing is the human brain. Now, this may throw you for a little bit of a loop, okay? But if we keep in mind what we just looked at, that cluster of bees, and we come up here and we read this, each neuron in the human brain has on average 7,000 synaptic connections to other neurons. And if you look, that cluster of bees is mimicking this brain. And each of those bees acts as a different synaptic relay. So the average swarm of honeybees has roughly 10,000 bees in it. And those bees act as their own hybrid brain with a unique synaptic pathway and connection. And by doing so, they are able to then go through and do a lot of communication. So if we go back over here and we look, this is a different swarm cluster. These bees are all up here in this cluster. And what is actually going to happen is we're going to say this one little bee right here leaves, and that's a scout bee, and it flies off, and it goes out there to find a bit of information. And then it brings that tiny bit of information back, and it communicates it here to the cluster, which then spreads that information. You've got another bee over here that leaves and goes finds a completely different piece of information and brings that piece of information back. So you've got each of these little bees that are all contributing minute amounts of information to the superorganism. And that superorganism then acts just like the synapses and the neurons inside the brain. And they start bouncing each of these little pieces of information that the bees have gathered back and forth and back and forth. And they can actually make decisions. Not only can they make decisions, they make the right decision every single time. So if we come over and we look, this is the way that a swarm actually works in nature. You start off by having that main swarm cluster that we saw hanging in a tree. They send out scouts. One scout finds a tree cavity off over to the west. And then this scout, it comes over here and finds a tree cavity over to the east. And if you notice, this tree cavity's opening is a little bit smaller than this tree cavity right here. And so these bees go in and they do a lot of different things. So just to kind of drive this home, Let's go through and let's stop and let's take a, a, just a moment to think about what this actually means. You've got a bee that goes and finds a location and that specific location, that bee is going to get every bit of information that it can from that location. It's gonna do this by 
first walking around the perimeter of that opening and actually measuring how big is the opening? Is it small? Is it large? Is it something that we can guard very easily? Next, it's gonna go inside the opening and it's gonna do these little, they're like run jumps where it jumps and then zips and then jumps and then zips. And it's testing the inside of the cavity to see if there's any barriers, if there's a block that it's gonna hit, if there's pieces of wood that hang down to know what the internal volume of that looks like. It will then leave that entrance and it will fly around and it will memorize the opening and then it's gonna go back in and it's gonna go a different direction. It will repeat this process until it is literally touched every inch of the internal surface of that specific cavity. It knows the air temperature, it knows the humidity, it knows the opening, it knows if there's enough volume in there for really what they need. And they prefer, the, the European honeybee prefers a cavity volume of roughly 10 gallons. It doesn't matter if it's narrow and it goes up 10 foot or if it's square like an aquarium. As long as it meets that minimum requirement and it's easy to guard, they will then bring that information back. So when they go over and they bring the information back, they're bringing that information back to this colony and they're bringing it back up in here. And so the bee goes and it says, well, this opening is actually really easy to guard. And so it comes over and it tells the rest of the bees. In this scenario, we're going to pretend like this cavity and this cavity are identical except for those openings. And so what happens is both of those bees come back and they do their dances. They do that waggle dance that we talked about. And they say, I found a home site that is exactly a mile away in this direction. And this, and again, this is where it blows our mind because we cannot interpret how they do this. They're using a dance that talks about so many different things, but yet they're able to convey this nest site is really good. It's not, a, there's not a lot of dampness or moisture in the bottom of it. The entrance is small enough. We can easily guard it without having to modify it. And also like the internal volume is perfect for what we need. And it's this far off the ground, which is even better for predators. So when this bee does its dance, it is purely honest and it's very vigorous. And it's like, I have found an amazing home site. Everybody should check that out. This bee comes back and again, they don't lie. They have no ego. So when this bee does its dance, it says, hey, I found this home site. It's, it's really similar to what that bee found, but the opening is a little bit too big. It's just, it's, you know, I'm not so sure that we can guard it without having to modify it in some way. So it's kind of eh. So in that process, what ends up happening is the bee that had the kind of meh dance doesn't recruit as many bees. But the bee that had the really vigorous dance recruits more bees. And this process continues throughout the day until the entire colony has made the decision that this, out of all of the different home sites that we've looked at, is the best home site for us. Now, one of the other things that happens there is a book by Tom Seeley called Honey Bee Democracy. And the, the little funny part about that is honeybees are actually an oligarchy, not a democracy. But the way that it works is the decision is actually made over here. It's made at the new home site. Once there is between 150 and 250 bees that have all decided that is the best site, this forms a quorum and they make the decision. And then they come back to the main swarm cluster and they go through and anybody that is still dancing for a lesser site, they actually do a buzz stop. They buzz and they hit them and they make them stop dancing. And they tell them, no, no, we found a better thing. The decision's been made. This is where we're going. And that entire swarm cluster then lifts off and moves and flies over to the new home site. Now, just to, to really make sure that everybody has understood, do you grasp the gravity of that. They have all the different options out there. You can go through and you can give them so many different variables. And every time they're going to measure all of those variables, compile all that data together into that super organism brain, and then make a cohesive decision. And every time, if you change the variables and you make one less desirable, it will no longer be a possible option. And if you increase this over here and make it a more desirable option, more bees will come to it. And every time they choose the best location. Now there's one other thing here. And I'm, I really, really want to focus in on how this actually works and make sure that everybody understands 
So real quick, we're going to play a fun little game and I am going to switch to the next slide. And can you see me? You can't see me. Why can't you see me? It's dark. Oh, here, is that better? You can see me now, right? But all you can see is my eyes. Oh, oh, there's somebody else over there. I don't know who that is. Oh, there's someone down there too. What is going on? And the most astounding part of this entire experiment is the simple fact that nine times out of 10, these communications with the exception of a swarm cluster in the sun on a branch are happening in the dark, in the complete and absolute dark. Nobody can see each other. They don't know where that bee is dancing. They don't see the angle of that dance. All they are seeing is pitch black. They don't see this other stuff, right? So you've got these little bees and they're doing precision geometry and dancing in these exact angles and in this exact formation, but nobody can see it. None of the other bees can see it. All they can do is feel the vibration rippling through the comb and yet still, they are able to detect exactly what that bee is communicating and then convey that to the other bees and leave that colony and go to the exact location where they were told that thing was going to be. That's insane. That is phenomenal. And it's a tiny little insect. So we've covered pheromones. We've covered dancing. We've covered vibration. And you're now starting to get a tiny, tiny little hint of what it is like inside that colony and how that colony is actually going through and making decisions. So if we move on from there, we're gonna take a tiny little detour here and we're gonna talk about outdated notions of nutrition from the beekeepers perspective, from us beekeepers. And we've learned a lot over the years, but this is kind of how we used to think about bees nutrition. We would go through and we would create a sugar syrup, which is literally one part water to one part pure table sugar, just sucrose nothing fancy. And we will feed that to the bees by going through and placing it into the colonies at the time of year when the bees have no real nectar available in nature. So if you've got a colony that is like right now, um, if, if you don't know the term, we are technically in what's called the summer dearth, meaning there's no food available. There's nothing growing. There's nothing alive to feed the bees and sustain them. If your colony happens to eat through all of its food stores and they have nothing else coming in, they can starve out and die. So we will provide them a sugar syrup and we'll put it into a jar or a feeder and we will go through and we will feed the bees. Now it's just, again, it's just straight up sugar and water. It's sucrose, that's all it is. The bees typically feed on fructose, glucose, and dextrose. Those are the three primary ones and it's mainly fructose and glucose that they feed, they feed on. Sucrose, when it is broken down, becomes each of those individual parts of sugar. So we go through and we do it that way. Now I do have one little caution for everybody out there. And this is a very, very important caution. If you make sugar syrup, be it for bees, or if you make sugar syrup, say for hummingbirds, because you've got a bird feeder and you're gonna go through and you're gonna put that out there. What you do not want to do ever is go through and boil that sugar. So in the actual making of your sugar, this is what you don't wanna do. You take the water and you boil the water on its own accord off to the side, and then you move it off of the heat and you add your sugar to it and dissolve the sugar. If you put the sugar in the water and boil them both together, what you end up doing is creating a chemical reaction that makes a chemical called hydroxymethylferferol. And hydroxymethylferferol is deadly. It is toxic to the bees. So again, anytime you go through and you are making sugar for bees or for hummingbirds or for any purpose, do not boil the sugar and the water together on your stove. Do it separately and have it hot water only, take it off of the heat, then put the sugar in it and mix it up. That is the best way to do that because you may be feeding your hummingbirds, but some of you may have noticed at certain times of the year when there's no other food out there, if your hummingbird feeder isn't just perfect and tight, you will have a big cluster of honeybees that will happily drain that feeder very, very quickly. So it's up to us to make sure that we go through and we take care of the bees and make sure that the bees do as good as they can. So moving back over to our presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll jump off my little soapbox on uh, do not boil your honey uh, or your, not your honey, but your, your nectar. So the other thing that beekeepers will go through and feed is what we call a pollen substitute. 
And a pollen substitute is literally a protein derived from either corn, soy, or in some newer cases, from seaweed. And we put this out whenever the bees have no na like natural pollen available out there in the environment for them. We will make these pollen patties and put them inside the colony because the bees need the pollen just like they did from the flowers. This will help the colony between the pollen patty and the nectar or the sugar syrup go through and sustain these dearths, these times where there is no food. So all that being said, it kind of makes you stop and say, wait a minute, what did we actually just feed our bees? Because I'm not necessarily sure. So if we go back and we, we, we rewind this a little bit and we kind of play dumb through here, we know that nectar equals sugar. And sugar for a bee equals carbohydrates. And carbohydrates for all of us equals energy. This is the primary source of nectar. So we've got that one. We understand that, right? Nectar's good. Okay, pollen. Pollen equals the protein for the bees. And the bees use the protein for, well, uh, let's, uh, let's just skip that and move on. Okay, water. We talked about they can use water. They find a water site. That's all good. So they go through, they find this water site. Everything's looking great. And then all of a sudden, wait, so water is, well, water is water. Okay, that's awesome. And they use water for, well, we're not entirely sure. I did say that they use the water to help cool down the hive, but surely they use it for other things. I mean, they drink it, they need to stay hydrated like the rest of us. So maybe that's what water's for. And then there's this thing called propolis. Yes, everybody stop, scratch your head. And you're like, propyl what? Propolis. Propolis is actually the bees, and this is another way that they go through and they exhibit this intelligence. It is the bees going out and going to very specific trees that produce a sap or a resin, and they purposefully select the key elements from these different trees that in large quantities would be caustic or toxic. They gather those, they put them onto their hind legs, just like they do the pollen, they bring it back to the colony and they mix it with a little bit of wax and they create what's called propolis. Propolis, propolis is extremely sticky. It's almost like tar. And they use it to glue things together inside their colony. They use it to seal out any little air gaps and it becomes almost their external immune system. Because it is caustic and toxic in large quantities, it is actually antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal. It coats and sanitizes and protects the entire interior of their hive, which then keeps the colony even more healthy. Now, one other little side note to this, the wax itself is basically like the bee's liver. That wax actually absorbs and pulls toxins into it and it pulls them away from the bees and that helps keep the bees healthier as well. So these are some little things here that when we talk about this stuff, you know, we talk about it on the high level as the beekeeper, and it's like, well, I mean, I kind of know, you know, we're, we were just told we feed them this, and that's why we do it, but we don't necessarily go into that much depth. Now, as time has gone on, we have learned a lot more that tells us what really should and should not actually be shown or given to the bees, and what should be given to them instead. So some of these things we will learn here come back and kind of disprove some old wives tales. So again, nectar. That little bee goes out and it forages for nectar. One of the old thought processes was that the flowers, all the flowers that we grow and that we love, those flowers started producing nectar because they needed to lure a bee in and the bee is naturally hairy and the pollen will then stick to that bee's hair. And when the bee moves and it continues doing its foraging and it goes to the next flower, it eventually ends up looking like this. It is completely covered in pollen. And so this evolutionary trait has gone through and it has allowed the bees to go and find this pollen accidentally. That's at least that's how they kind of wanted it to seem whenever you first learn these things in school and when you're in like high school and grade school and stuff you know, you learn, oh, well, the flower has male parts and has female parts, and it goes through and it produces this sweet substance to attract pollinators to it. So the pollinators will move around the pollen and be able to then fertilize that plant and help that plant grow and make seeds or fruit and new, you know, spread and reproduce. Well, if that was true, if the only reason that the bees are going to the flower is for the nectar, 
and the pollen was a side effect, then that would mean that the bees just found something to do with the pollen, right? But that's actually not the case because if it was all about the nectar and that was truly the only thing that the bees were looking for, then you would not have situations like we're gonna see here in this next slide. This right here is a pollen powder that is a fake artificial pollen substitute. It is in a powdered form and it has been put outside in a box that was protected from the wind, but it's open so that the bees can gain access. There is nothing sweet here. There is nothing to attract them other than this protein source. At certain times of the year, when there is no protein available, there's no pollen available, the bees actively look for these sources. Now, at, for you at home, this may be a sawdust pile while you're outside doing woodworking and suddenly you see that there's bees crawling around in the sawdust. They're actually looking for the microscopic little nutrients and protein that are in that and they will take that back to the hive. If you raise chickens and you have a big bag of chicken feed and you spill some on the ground, at certain times of year, the bees will go to chicken feed and goat feed and pig feed and they will roll and frolic in the dust and the powder from that feed because they're collecting the protein that they need and they will carry that back to the hive. So this means that the bees are purposefully going out and finding protein separate from the nectar. So the flower just made it more encouraging to come and visit me as opposed to going to some other source, but the bees will look for the pollen regardless if there is nectar there or not. Now inside the nectar and in the pollen, mainly in the pollen, there's trace amounts of this in the nectar, but mainly in the pollen, you have the 10 essential amino acids that are the building blocks for all life. They can be found in this pollen. So not just protein, all these amino acids are in there. In addition to those amino acids, you have other essential minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Now, if you go out there and you take one, one sample of pollen from nature, this right here is a graph that displays a specific type of pollen. And you can see on here all of those different building blocks and the different levels that each of those building blocks are displayed or exhibited inside that specific sample of pollen. Now, in nature, this is what we would hope that everything looks like. It's beautiful. We have this huge variety, beautiful colors, lots of different flowers. Some of them just make nectar. Some of them, like the Texas Blue Bonnet, just makes pollen. It doesn't even make nectar. But at certain times of the year, each of these flowers are very crucial and they play a very, very key role in what the bees need. And just as diverse and colorful as this image is, the pollen that comes from it is equally just as diverse and colorful. If you go through and you look at that pollen under a microscope, you will see every specific species of plant has an extremely unique pollen grain or pollen kernel that is inside that pollen. Now, one of the other things that is truly, truly amazing here is that the bees, when they go out there and they are foraging and they collect that pollen, those granules sometimes are not nutrient available or readily available for the bees. So they take that pollen, they pack it down into a cell, they mix little bits of the honey with it, as well as other key enzymes that the bee produces, and they create what's called bee bread out of pollen. This creates a fermentation process that actually cracks open those pollen shells and makes the nutrients inside more readily available and easier to consume and digest for the bees and for the larva. So that's where that pollen comes in. Those proteins are very, very, very important because the bees ingest them and then they turn them into glandular excretions that are then turned around and fed back to create the larva, or in the case of the queen bee, royal jelly, which is again, a glandular excretion that is thick, white, bitter, viscous substance that they feed to the queen bee her entire life. That's all she ever gets to eat through her entire developmental stages are just royal jelly. And that is created from the nurse bees eating this protein from the pollen and then developing that protein in those glands into this other excretion. So what does this have to do with the intelligence bees? I mean, again, it, it is going through and it's talking about how they have adapted and how they can do things. But that decision making that we talked about earlier, that plays a very key role. So let's go through here real quick and let's take a look at a study that was actually done at one of the universities where they went through and they took a bunch of different types of pollen and they took eight different colonies and they isolated those colonies 
And they went through and they did this experiment where they had these different groups of these fake pollen substitutes. Each of these substitutes has a different makeup or composition and every single one of them may be deficient in the exact same thing or varying degrees of deficiency in other things. So the way that this study worked, and I've actually written this out here, I'll go through and read it for everybody as well, but you feel free to read along and hopefully I don't get tongue tied in the middle of all of this. But this is the, the synopsis of the study. Honeybee colonies foraging predominantly on a single pollen source may encounter nutritional deficits. In the present study, we examine the nutritional resilience of honeybee colonies, testing whether foragers would shift their foraging efforts towards resources that complemented a nutritional deficit. Eight honeybee colonies were kept in in-screened closures and fed for one week a pollen substitute diet deficient in a particular essential amino acid. Foragers were subsequently then tested for a preference between the exact same diet previously fed, a diet that was different but similarly deficient, or a diet that complemented the deficiency. Foragers preferred the complementary diet over the same and similar diets every time. Appetitive conditioning tests showed that bees were able to discriminate also between the same and similar diets. Overall, the results support the hypothesis that honeybees prefer dietary diversity and that they do not just include novel sources, but specifically targeted nutritionally complementary ones. Whereas this specifically focused on deficiencies in essential amino acids, we cannot rule out the fact that the bees were also complementing correlated imbalances in other nutrients, most notably essential fatty acids. The ability of honeybees to counter nutritional deficiencies contributes to the mechanisms which insects use to sustain homeostasis at the colony level, social insects. That was the key part there. I almost made it all the way through that without getting tongue tied, but hey, that's a lot of uh, high tech stuff there. This is the site where that came from and the article specifically. So that is the site for that. Uh, if you wanna take a screenshot of that or take a picture of it with your phone and go and read that entire report, please feel free to do so. It is actually a very, very, very interesting and detailed account of how these bees make those decisions. Now, in addition to this and along the same lines, we talked about how the bees also can choose water sources. Well, a very similar study goes through and talks about in the fall when the floral sources dwindle, this study shows that bees seek out specific nutrients, mainly calcium, magnesium, potassium, which are all commonly found in pollen by instead foraging in compound rich, dirty water, quote unquote, dirty water. When the flowers and the pollen are abundant in the summer and the spring, technically, the bees prefer deionized water and sodium water, ultimately suggesting that the bees are foraging for minerals in the water based on what is lacking in their floral diet. So again, we have these examples of how the bees were able to go through and compensate. But not only are they compensating, they know. That's the killer right there. They know we don't have enough of this specific protein. We need to change our forage and we need to go find it and bring that in so that we can be overall complete and healthy. Now, some other amazing little things in here. Um, side note very quickly, there was a gentleman, uh, is a gentleman, I should say. Um, his name is Jeffrey Dunn, I believe. And he does a series of YouTube videos that in uh, several of those videos he titles as the bees choose or honey bees choose. And in those videos, he does these experiments where he'll set out four identical feeders and then he will change one aspect of the feeders and then let the bees decide what they need. And he has done this with water and shown that at certain times of the year, just like this study showed, they preferred purified water using a pure filter. And they passed up the pond water that had all this other stuff. But if you repeat that same experiment at a time of year when there is no pollen available, then they prefer the pond water. So they're constantly shifting and changing their needs based on whatever they're deficient in inside the colony. Now, all of that aside, and all of this decision-making aside, here's another interesting little fact about bees. We talked about those compound eyes. They can see in color. They can see every color with the exception of red. So the wall behind me that is red and black checkerboard to the bees would just look like a solid black background they don't actually see the color red and they don't see in the infrared spectrum. Now, one of the ways that we were able to go through and determine, not we as in me, but we as in society and scientists and people, 
Um, one of the ways that they were able to go through and figure this out was by going and actually doing an experiment with these colored discs. They would take these colored discs and they would place them out and they would put sugar on one specific color. They would have that sugar feed out there or even a drop of honey on a specific disc. So if they wanted the bees to go to the blue disc, they would turn around and they would set a container of either honey or sugar syrup on this blue disc. They leave it out there. They let the bees communicate to the colony that this is where your food source is. And then they would rearrange all of these circles and they would move this blue disc and it might take the spot of the green disc. And so now the green disc would be down here, but the blue disc with the food is now up here. The bees, when they came back and realized that the blue had moved, shifted and would then go to the new location of that. After they had done this a couple of times and the bees got accustomed to knowing that blue meant there was food, the bees then really proved it by going and taking the food away altogether. Again, rearranging all those colored circles or, or squares, they had little square pieces technically, rearranging them again and the bees would still come back and they would find that blue square. And every time they repeated this process, they could change the color and show, okay, now green today is gonna mean that there's food there. And they would get the bees used to knowing that that was green and that meant food. They could take the food away and the bees would still seek out that green tile or green circle or green square. It's amazing the way that that actually worked and the way they did that. Now, a funny little side note story. We had a keynote speaker come to the Texas um, Beekeepers Convention uh, last year, and he is from the University of Montana. And they did a study where he goes through and he actually trains bees. And he says that a honeybee is actually far more capable of detecting drugs, chemicals, explosive compounds, than a dog. So again, it goes back to the whole fact that the bees have a much more evolved and acute sense of smell and an olfactory receptors that can go through and distinguish all these things. But what they did is they trained the bee to recognize their logo for their college football team. And then when they did their big homecoming game and they had the rival team out there, they showed this on camera on the big screen out there on the stadium they showed the honeybees and they had the alternate team's logo and they had their logo. And every time the bee would go through the maze and it knew that if it kept following that team's logo, it would find a reward and a food source. So every time it was presented with the logo from the opposing team, they wouldn't go there. They would turn around and go the other direction. And then ultimately they announced to everybody that even honeybees like us better than they like you. So um, that's just one of the fun little ways that uh, they have done some of these experiments. But Moving over from this and moving away from uh, my little side tangent there on stories, they know color, they know this, but there's other things that the bees know as well. For instance, they know math. We would already talked about the fact that they know geometry, right? But they know math. And not only do they know math, they know that if they have three pots of honey and you take two of those pots of honey away, there's only one pot of honey left. And if I want to be nice and I want to give my friend that one last pot of honey, well, that means there are zero pots of honey left. Honeybees actually know the concept of absolute zero. They know what it means to run out. They know what it means to only have a little bit left. And these are things that previously we only attributed to this stuff to basically primates. When we would go through and we would do studies on chimpanzees, you know, we rationalize that they understand that, they know that because they're closer to humans, but we never really thought that a bee could quite understand this concept. Ultimately though, the whole point of this is do you think you know more than us bees? That's highly doubtful. It is highly doubtful. And the more we learn from them, the more fascinating we find that they are. The best thing that we can do for the bees is to make sure that they always have a robust, diverse, pollination field of beautiful flowers so that they have those diversities in all of those different aspects and nutrients to go through and help them achieve the stasis that they need to stay healthy, stay happy, and continue thriving. So hopefully you all enjoyed that. And that is the, the presentation on the intelligence of bees. And uh, I'm not sure where Kate vanished to, but I will uh, let her pop up now if she has any questions that she got from the group and we can go through and tackle those in the, the last little bit of time we've got here. 
Hey, John, thanks. That was great. Um, so I haven't seen any questions yet. Y'all uh, toss out your questions if you've got them. We'll see. That was really interesting um, about the water in the dirty water. We had one of our master gardeners talk some about uh, bees at hands on in the garden. It was a while back and she was saying that she didn't really worry about cleaning the water too much because the bees didn't mind it. And there's science yeah. behind yeah. that. That was really yeah. cool. Um, one of the things that we would actually realize is you could put out a fresh bowl of water and you could have that setting outside and refill it every single day. And yet the bees would keep going to your drippy faucet where there's like a little bit of mold and moss and stuff growing. And they would prefer to go to that and drink from it because one, it's reliable. It's always there. And two, it's got these microorganisms in it that they actually need. One of the other things that they will do is they will switch their foraging habits to salt as well. So there are some times of the year where they may bombard your neighbor's swimming pool because in sunlight, chlorine can actually convert over into sodium chloride. You become becomes a salt. So the bees will gather that salt and take it back. They use it to help dehydrate the nectar down to a honey substance, and they use it to get those salt minerals and stuff that they need from it as well. Wow. I did okay. pop in here. <laughs> yeah, we've got a question that just popped up. So it says, are the chemicals in city water bad for bees? So when they did this experiment and they gave the different test subjects for the bees, the bees least favorite water was tap water straight out of the faucet. They preferred the pure water that was ran through a purification filter in the times of year where there was readily available pollen and nectar out there. And they preferred the dirty pond water or even spring fed pond water at other times of the year when there was not any other food sources out there. But their least choice and the thing they drank the slowest was always the tap water. So it could be that there are chemicals in there. We put a lot of things in our tap water and the bees pick up on that and naturally avoid that. Um, and that's one of those ways where they may know better than we do. Um, there's a reason, you know, I have a filtration system at my house because especially here in Austin these days, I don't want to be drinking zebra mussel water. <laughs> like, <laughs> Understandable. Okay, we've got one more question. It says, how does a bee become a queen? Ah, okay, so that's actually really cool. Um, the queen is not born. She is not a magical egg that is designed to be a queen straight from birth. The queen is chosen by the bees going through and actually finding an egg that is at just the right age. So on day one, it's an egg. On D3, it hatches into the first stage of its larval development. On that day, for the third day, they can pick that larva and instead of feeding it a little bit of royal jelly and then a lot of brood food and nectar and honey, they only feed it royal jelly and they feed it copious amounts of royal jelly. So it's actually what the queen does not get to eat that allows her to develop into a queen bee. If she were fed the pollen and the honey and the other stuff, it would actually stunt her into a worker. And by not doing that, by just feeding her this extremely nutrient dense royal jelly, it actually allows her to go through a full pupation and metamorphosis which takes less time. She can develop in 16 days where the normal worker takes 21. She actually has organs inside of her body that the other bees don't even have. They have an organ called a spermacatha, which actually holds all the genetic material after she mates. She mates one time with multiple drones, but one time in her life, and then she never mates again. She stores all that material. And that's an organ that the regular worker does not have. And it's all from her diet. It's just from the royal jelly. That's cool. Okay, we've got three more and then we'll probably have to call time on this. So one is, is the need for salt why bees are attracted to sweaty gardeners? <laughs> Maybe. It's a quick place to stop and grab a little drink and pick up some salt and take it back home. That could very well be true. Now, one of the things about the bees though, if you're in the garden and a bee lands on you and is walking around or is, is tickling you and drinking, it's fine. If the bee was actually mad and gonna sting you, the stinger would have been the first thing that touched your body. It's not gonna land, walk around and then sting you. It's gonna come in butt first and sting you immediately. So if they're landing on you and walking, they're either taking a break, they smell your perfume or your shower, your, you know, shower body wash and stuff. Or again, they may be drinking the sweat off of the body and using it for the minerals, but that is absolutely the case, yes. That's cool. 
Okay. Um, how does a European hive become Africanized? Okay, so that was scientists at their worst. Um, they went over to Africa and they were looking for a specific strain of bee. And they were going to take that bee and cross it with the European honeybee, which is Apis mellifera. They thought they had this specific strain of bee, but instead they got Apis scutellata. And they brought scutellata back. And scutellata has a really bad attitude, but they didn't realize that was the bee species they had. They crossed Apis mellifera with Apis scutellata, and you get Apis mellifera scutellata. And then the research lab in Brazil accidentally let five swarms escape. They then ran rampant. And since how they are still a subspecies of Apis mellifera, they can easily interbreed. So when you hear the reports on the news, this may terrify everybody, but it's a misnomer. Every time somebody gets attacked and, and the homeowner was mowing their yard and got stung by killer bees or Africanized bees, that's not necessarily true. You can have the nicest, most docile colony in the world. And I guarantee you, if you hit them with a lawnmower, they're going to try to kill you. It doesn't mean they're Africanized. But an Africanized bee, to tie it back really quickly into the whole thing about like pheromones, Africanized genetics and European genetics are only 10% difference. You cannot tell them apart visually. You cannot tell them apart by their color. They're both a honeybee but they do have a higher level of defensive behavior and they're more aggressive at everything. So they release a lot of pheromones at the drop of a hat and they respond at a high level to the slightest remark of pheromone. Whereas a European honeybee takes a lot of time to decide to release pheromones. And then when they do, they don't re release a lot and it takes the rest of the colony a lot of pheromones before they ramp up. So this is what causes those drastic reactions. But the way you get it is you have a beehive that beehive decides to swarm. Their queen with the good genetics leaves. They raise a new queen. She goes off and she mates. Maybe 10% of the bees she mates with have Africanized genetics or are Africanized. Then 10% of the eggs she lays are going to have an Africanized genetic profile. If she then leaves and they pick one of those eggs to make a new queen out of, now you've got a queen that has Africanized genetics and she's still going to go mate and potentially mate with more Africanized bees and it just compounds itself. That's how that works. Okay. Um, okay, we've got two, but these are pretty big questions. So I can answer one of them very quickly. Um, is there something I should put out for visiting bees? No. Um, it is not advised to open feed because you're also alerting all the other predators that feed on bees that there's a food source there. And when you have a communal feeding space like that, the bees can actually transmit diseases to each other through the food source and through contact as well as varroa mites can climb from the back of one bee to another. So if you see a bee and you see those TV things that say, oh, feed it some sugar, feed it some honey, don't ever do that. And don't feed it store-bought honey because it can actually have American fowl brood and you'll kill all of our bees. So it's best just to leave them be. Wow. Okay, do you wanna pick one of those other two questions? How do the bee, how do the hive communicate when they need to split? Um, so it is based on we have a lot of bees. We have no more comb that is open for food or brood, either one. So we're cramped. We have no more space, which means we are very successful. We should now divide and make a new colony. That's the, that is the base bones reason of why that happens. It's all about that. Now they could be in a semi truck, but they don't look at all that empty space as potential. They only look at their comb. So when their comb is full and they've got a lot of bees and a lot of food and a lot of babies, it's time to divide and go make a new colony. Wow. Okay. All right. One last question for the night. Um, how do insecticides disrupt bees activity? Um, there are a lot of ways that that can happen. So one of the things that you may hear about is called sublethal effects. And a sublethal effect means that it doesn't kill the bee outright, but it causes damage to the bee. And a lot of times it's not necessarily that first bee that gets it. So if you sprayed your flowers and your plants with an insecticide, or even in some cases, a uh, fungicide, those two things can be brought back to the colony and mixed together can create havoc. The fungicide can stop the fermentation process that they need to break those pollen kernels apart. It can stop the process to make honey. They then use that food to try to feed the babies and it's no longer as nutrient dense as it was before. Also, the chemical comes into play and it gets mixed into the food or if it's systemic like neonicotinoids, it's already in the nectar and in the pollen. They feed that to the developing young and now that young develops with mental handicaps. And now you've got an, a bee that is an, an adult bee that doesn't have a proper GPS system and can't navigate correctly. So it leaves to go find food. 
and then it can't remember where home was. It doesn't have that memorization that the other bees do. So those are some of the effects, the sublethal effects that can cause a colony to ultimately crash and die because it compounds itself as it goes on time over time again. Um, other things can be birth defects or just straight up killing them slowly or making the drones and the queen both infertile. So the queen goes off and she mates, but all the drones are infertile and none of the semen actually has any value to the queen or the queen is infertile and none of her eggs are valuable. And therefore she comes back, they think they've got a queen and she's trying to lay eggs, but nothing happens. The colony shrinks and dies. So there's a lot of different ways that can have an effect. Wow, okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was fantastic. I learned a lot um, and we've had several comments on there from folks who really enjoyed it. So thanks for your time, John. Um, You're welcome. And and I'll just give a shout out. He does have a website, wickedbeapiary.com. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So lots of good stuff on there if you want some more information from John. You guys have a great evening. Thank you all for tuning in. I much appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this will be on Facebook Live. You can watch it on our Facebook page, and then we'll try to get it posted online, too, if you want to share it. So. With that, we'll say good night. Okay. All right, Brent, I don't know if you're still there, but I'm gonna end the meeting. Thanks for helping host.